let me um, let me introduce uh, our last uh, speaker. Uh, Oscar Holacek is joining us from Berkeley. Um, I guess I actually don't know that you're actually in Berkeley, but uh, seems plausible. Um, and uh, Oscar's worked on a, a wide variety of problems in evolutionary dynamics, connecting to experiments on on uh, different kinds of systems, and he's been particularly interested in the interplay between dynamics and spatial structure, which is the subject of his talk for today. And I will let him get started. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, William. Uh, Bill, um, it's a real pleasure to play a role in this event. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it has been a fantastic workshop uh, so far. So I'm very thankful for uh, the invitation. Uh, to everybody who was involved in organizing that. Um, and yes, as Bill said, um, I want to talk today about um, spatial aspects uh, of evolution because I think and I want to convince you that it can be a really important part of what's making up evolutionary dynamics, um, but uh, we know not so much yet about it in, in, in many systems is what I would argue. Um, to get started, um, you know, if you think about evolution, we often think about the really long time scales, and then we tend to think about uh, evolution as something that's unfolding in time, and we ignore space um, a little bit, because maybe the view is, well, over these long time scales, you're averaging over space, and uh, that's why it might not be uh, that important, and in some cases, that might be the right point of view to simplify things. Uh, but there's certainly very rapid evolutionary processes that unfold in space and affect our lives also. Um, um, and, and some of them we've seen today. Um, oh, so here, so evolution plays out in, over time and space. Uh, our beloved pandemic uh, certainly has done that uh, quite rapidly uh, over just four months. It's spread from China um, you know, to the rest of the world. Um, that's an intricate process, spatial process. But there are many others. Uh, if you look inside of us, um, in our guts, uh, we have lots of bacteria that lived it there, uh, you know, on the order of 10 to the 13. And it's a, um, and these, the, this microbiome we now know is really quite important for our health. Um, it, you know, it helps us digest nutrients, um, it uh, regulates our immune system, and also it fends off uh, pathogenic invaders. But the focus was so far in this field, field mostly on the ecological side. But, you know, recently we and others could show that, uh, so this was uh, mostly Benjamin Good and Nandita Garud who spearheaded that research, uh, could show that, well, actually uh, the microbiome in us is uh, evolving over human relevant time scales. Um, so we don't know yet whether that uh, affects us, that part, um, that evolutionary part, but it's definitely there. And um, I guess it was a good bet uh, with 10 to the 13 microbes, uh, bacteria in our guts, dividing once per day, you get, uh, you know, a billion or more new mutations entering that population. Uh, some of them will be beneficial, and so one can expect perhaps uh, evolution uh, to go on. And there are many uh, other examples I just added, you know, here the biomes, microbiomes, biofilms are very structured bacterial um, um, communities, you know, that are compared to um, uh, cities of bacteria. Um, then in us again, um, can solid cancers are spatially structured uh, evolutionary systems, and I just added the immune system after hearing um, Ivana talk about it and realizing or finding evidence that we have to think about it uh, in, in a spatial context. Um, and as physicists, uh, what we'd like to do is to, to think about these problems and come up with uh, some kind of um, theoretical description. And um, I guess one common trait of uh, physicists is that we don't strive to describe all the details of these super complex systems. We tend to go for, um, there are different names for that, effective theories, where we only 
try to incorporate um, the um, essential features of the system uh, that are necessary uh, to actually generate uh, the absorbed phenomena. So suppress all the unnecessary details, only keep the, the essence um, to, to describe um, the most interesting, let's say, part of the phenomenon. And the way I say it, it's already clear like um, that there are big questions about, you know, what is really essential and what is an interesting part of the dynamics. <clears throat> um, that's hard to define a priori. And I hope to show you examples where you can just uh, see or learn by example, more or less, of what that might, uh, might be. Um, at any rate, such effective theories have been uh, highly successful in physics. We know and love them there, where we uh, explain systems of many degrees of freedom with just a few um, effective parameters, let's say in statistical physics. Um, effective theories uh, have also been successful in uh, biology, um, widely in biophysics. Um, there are many fields that use them. Um, also in evolution, uh, when it comes to um, populations that are unstructured, that are completely well mixed. Um, so even in epidemiology, you know, when you have a local well mixed population, a new um, virus comes in, well, at first it spreads exponentially. That's a pretty, it's a simple theory, but a pretty decent one. And sometimes it works quite well. A uh, much less um, trivial example is, uh, you know, are these nice models that um, Ivana had talked about, about um, adapting uh, populations, well-mixed microbial uh, populations that are adapting in our test tubes. Maybe try to destroy spatial structure by shaking them very well. And uh, there we have gained some understanding of how um, evolution works uh, over the last uh, decades. But uh, when it comes to structured uh, spatially or ecologically structured models or populations, um, we, we still know surprisingly little, I would say, maybe not surprising because coming from physics, we know when we go away from um, mean field models, life can become difficult and dominated by fluctuations. And those are sometimes hard to understand. That's one reason why uh, theorizing can be difficult here. Um, but another reason is that there's just one well-mixed structure, uh, but many possible spatial or ecological structures. So what to focus on is like one intrinsic challenge in this problem. So one has to kind of identify, um, I would say, interesting um, uh, structures that allow you to, to formulate uh, these, uh, these models. And uh, so how, how do we generate them in the first place? Well, one resource is just thinking about the phenomena, think hard and uh, try to come up with a um, reasonable model. But that you could have done over the last 100 years and people have um, thought a lot about space as well in evolution. And progresses are made uh, in this way. There are theoretical advances um, over time but what's um, accelerating, I would say, over the last decade um, is the, the, the kind of evidence and data that can use to, to get inspired. Uh, so there are two ways, largely, uh, I would say, how you can get inspired. One is top down. You, you look at what you see uh, in these natural populations, like from these microbiomes, there are tremendous data sets of um, um, you know, where, where people have gone in and sequenced lots and lots of microbiomes from different people across time, uh, which you can look at. And of course, uh, for um, the pandemic, as Richard has shown, we have an, uh, a data set, you know, that in its scale we haven't seen uh, before. Um, but the disadvantage of natural populations is you can't do uh, experiments uh, very easily and actually check whether of whatever you're modeling uh, makes any sense. You can't perturb, uh, or you, you have to rely on natural experiments that are happening by chance. So the alternative is to actually do experiments in the lab, um, which you know often you can do um, with some model organisms, either microbes or maybe up to flies. Um, and there um, you can perhaps ideally see where the different 
let's say microbes are, how they are dividing, maybe make visual, uh, visible uh, mutations or you sequence the hell out of the populations. And that also gives you uh, inspiration uh, for how to set up these models. And, um, and these are the two pathways to end up with these models. And then you might ask, well, what's the point of the models? What, what is our goal? Um, obviously, they don't contain all the details of what we want to describe. So we can't ask um, all the questions. Like if we are interested in really predicting how um, the case numbers of, of the pandemic are rising in different places in the world, uh, you definitely have to put in uh, lots and lots of details. But the hope is that there are some, and for lack of a better word, I call them structural questions, where the answers are the same in the simplified models as in uh, the much more detailed models. In this case, then, uh, you can try to find the answers in the simple models and perhaps strongly constrain um, uh, the much more detailed models, right? So for instance, one example is, uh, I would say for the pandemic, you can ask, you know, people try to predict it, but one interesting question is also, what in principle is predictable? Where are the sources of chance? And I think there one can try to make progress with some simplified models of what are the key control parameters and how can those parameters be inferred uh, from data? And there are other uh, examples of that type. So that, <clears throat> I would say, that's in my view, uh, the goal of um, what, <clears throat> I would say many physicists that work on uh, effective models are trying to achieve. And uh, from this top-down view now, um, I will, for the rest of the talk, essentially want to give you two uh, examples where perhaps this is possible. Uh, one will be um, about you know, unbounded, unbound, unbounded growth, um, spreading processes um, you know, related to epidemics, but also to the spread of beneficial mutations. And the second one then will be um, uh, thinking about bounded growth, right? Where we have like in our microbiome um, bacteria that see walls all the time that are still dividing, but they cannot grow in number because they are ultimately spatially constrained. Uh, so these are the two, two parts um, of the talk, uh, which I'm going to dive in there uh, now. Just looking at the chat. So please, if you, if you have any question, put them in the chat. I should be able to see it, um, but also if Bill, if you think there's something important, interrupt me. So um, let me start now with um, some thoughts about um, the spread of uh, spreading processes in space. So they, the, such processes are pretty ubiquitous in biology. First of all, if you think about, if you come from evolution, uh, it's an important process. Um, I would say a dynamical building block of evolution because for adaptation to work, you need um, beneficial mutations to arise somewhere. Um, they arise at one location, obviously in one individual. And then if they're successful, they have to spread. So there's the spreading process. One reason to think about it, Another obviously is the spread of um, diseases, uh, but also the spread of information is something that can be quite rapid. So when that guy tweets, uh, you know, you can't help but knowing um, an hour later about it sometimes. But there are population expansions, um, like when a, when a new species uh, arises and is successful, like the humans uh, between 100 and 2000 years ago in Africa, they, uh, they start to spread um, and take over the world. That's a, a spreading process. Here, this little guy is, um, is a cane toad, by the way. Do you see my pointer? Can somebody give me a thumbs up? Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, which is an invasive species in Australia, was brought in there as an insect controlling agent um, to his, um, 80 years ago, about 80 years ago, and uh, turned out to not uh, eat those insects, but these cane toads then started to spread uh, and take over Australia. Um, also, this is just to show that uh, these spreading processes happen on many different scales, uh, also on the scale of colonies, microbial colonies, which we can study in the lab. And uh, you may ask, 
um, from a bird's eye view, you know, what patterns of spread are possible uh, in principle and what is their impact on evolution, right? So if there are different classes of spread, uh, different classes of dynamical ways in which this fitter mutant can take over the wild type, then these classes, these dynamical classes might have an impact also on long-term evolution. Um, I will mostly focus on the first part and because the second part is essentially a work in progress. Um, so now the epidemics are actually a good example to show that there might be um, different classes of spread. If you go back into the history and just follow or track oh, how the bubonic plague in the 14th century spread across sorry, Europe. Uh, maybe, maybe I can draw this. Someone asked the question that I think I know the answer to, but good to hear it from you about the, the out of Africa expansion. Um, those of us with longer memories will, will know that there were periods in which it was obvious, there were periods in which it was viewed as that, that it wasn't right. And what's mm -hmm. the. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on that, but now I think the answer can only be it's a conjecture because nobody has seen it. Um, and so the conjecture is based, of course, on, um, you know, looking at the distribution of bones uh, that was for a long time a very very noisy measurement of how they might have spread out of africa but now we have you know sequenced a lot uh, the human population and from these sequences i think you can quite definitely say that um, they moved out of africa so i think the probability is very high that this was the case but it's still a conjecture based on uh, sequencing um and here also a conjecture you know, based on historical records is that the bubonic plague, well, it started um, in, in Italy in the 14th century. <clears throat> now it's a, uh, these, these uh, bacteria, they live on fleas and the fleas live on, on rats and the rats were brought to the shores of Italy uh, on mer merchant ships. And from there then, uh, you know, a wave uh, emerged spreading across Europe uh, from south to north. Um, which was of course super deadly, but if there's something good to be said about it, uh, then that it was uh, quite a slow wave, just 300 to 600 kilometers per year. So if you knew that wave was coming, you could have easily outrun it. Uh, of course, you know, with, SAR, uh, with SARS uh, COVID-2, this is uh, not possible anymore. In just four months, it spread across the world. I show you, showed you that little animation before. And what's the difference? It's not the, not the difference in disease, but it's, uh, it's a difference in the way um, we are traveling and the pathogens with us. So in the, in the past, you know, people could walk or take the horse overland. Uh, but nowadays uh, we have for, uh, you know, we have an, not only an elaborate air transportation system, which is depicted here, but we have um, actually vehicles for ev almost every scale um, that we're interested in, right? So if we, uh, if I, would have gone to New York, would have, which I would have loved to do for this occasion, then, well, I, I might have first taken, I don't know, an electrical scooter to go to the BART, then I take the BART to the airport, and then over to the East Coast, and so on. So there are many steps in between for which we have vehicles. And it turns out that this hierarchy of vehicles apparently generates um, a mode of transport uh, that uh, is almost uh, scale-free. And that was first um, detected um, essentially by tracking dollar bills. Uh, some of you might remember that there were uh, single dollar bills with a stamp on them uh, saying track me at wheresgeorge.com. And um, so you could go online and type in the serial number of that dollar bill and then you would see where it was recorded before. So this was essentially just a hobby of um, a certain group of people that just love to track their dollar bills, but at some point was analyzed in terms of the question, okay, how far do dollar bills travel in a certain period of time? And maybe that's a proxy for how far humans are traveling over time. And what you see here is um, you see where dollar bills were, um, the distance, the uh, histogram of the distances 
um, that um, dollar bills traveled in a certain time period. The time period here was fixed to four days. And what you see on this double log plot, yeah, there's a peak, there's a pronounced peak at around 10 kilometers. So typical dollar bill would, would apparently travel 10 uh, kilometers in four days. But then uh, beyond that, there's, you know, about two orders of magnitude, a uh, pretty um, straight um, line in this double logarithmic plot. So there seems to follow um, a power law. It has a power law tail over two decades. And in the inset, it, they just changed the time period, I think, to 10 days. And so you might ask, um, of course, these, you know, having these long range transportation things uh, should accelerate uh, the spread, but um, does it really change uh, the spread just gradually or really in a fundamental way? That's essentially the question I want to ask. Um, and I can't summarize, or I don't really have the time to summarize all the history on uh, how people modeled uh, spreading processes with fischer kolmogorov waves and so on. Uh, instead, I'd love to just show you some uh, very simple simulations to get at this question. And ultimately, I try to at least um, put what we find in, in, in context to these older works. So the simple simulation uh, uh, goes like this. So you have a two-dimensional lattice, um, and um, we suppose that we start uh, the spreading process at the center. So imagine this is an infected site. Um, and then we let the infection spread um, by um, just iterating through a very simple computational time step. So um, step one is we randomly choose a site from our lattice, look at, the, look at the site. If it's empty, we do nothing. If it's infected, then we allow the infection to jump to a different place. And um, to do that, we also need to draw now from a distribution that we provide to that uh, simulation, we need to draw a jump distance. Um, so we draw that jump distance and then, and also a direction in a two dimensional case. Um, and then we let the infection spread to that, uh, to that place. Right, and then, and that's it. And that's what we iterate. And um, now, any reasonable jump kernel, I would say, should have kind of a peak at, not a peak, but should go up towards shorter distances, right? So that the most likely jumps that we, we will draw are short, right? And, and in that situation, what you generate at first will be kind of a cluster surrounding you, um, a patch. And, but as this patch is growing, then, um, you know, the, the, the likelihood also increases that one of these guys samples a bigger jump if the jump distribution has a sufficiently broad tail. And that then will kind of start uh, a new sub outbreak at this new location, which also then acquires uh, you know, a patch around it and so on. And, and these, these patches will then merge with the mother outbreak. And so on. this is kind of the dynamics that um, we want to understand here. Um, and for the purpose of being concrete, uh, I want to you know, fix the jump kernel to a form that has a power law tail. Well, one reason is to be concrete and to be able actually to classify the behaviors uh, which this power law kernel can. And the second reason is that, well, we have seen that these dollar bills have a power law kernel. Um, so we might as well assume one. So here d, little d is the number of dimensions and mu is a parameter that has to be larger than zero for this to be um, normalizable. Uh, and then one way to think about this kernel is to say the probability that the jump distance is larger than z decays like z to the power of minus mu. Um, okay, so now let me just show you some uh, simulations that come out of that. Um, first, I want to start uh, by choosing mu <coughs> relatively large. So I, I choose mu to be 3.5. So that is um, obviously already a power law. Uh, and many people would say this is a kernel with a broad tail because it has a power law uh, tail. And in fact, before we did this work, people thought um, any power law tail should generate exponential growth. So let me run this movie, the simulation. You see it's quite noisy. 
Um, but as you let this patch grow larger and larger, what you find is it just grows like a pancake uh, whose diameter uh, grows linearly in time. Right? So, so this is a situation where you have finite speed. So you have a broad kernel, yet um, the growth of this uh, epidemic is still pretty slow, just finite speed. As you lower mu, you, you broaden the kernel. And at some point, you go over a threshold and reach a new regime, which I'm running now, where the crucial jumps uh, get larger and larger. Uh, you, you, you see distinct sub outbreaks, um, like here is one, uh, which drive the epidemic, accelerate the epidemic. And it turns out what you then see is, um, is a power law that is faster than linear in time. This is exponent here, it depends on mu and the dimensions. Um, but actually, the, what I should want to say about this kernel is that the kernel still has a finite mean and variance, right? Nevertheless, the behavior is quite different. And finally, as you lower mu even further, um, the epidemic becomes very, very fast. You know, you get outbreaks everywhere. Um, but yet, this is still not um, as fast as an exponentially growing um, uh, population. It, it grows like a stretched exponential where in the exponent <clears throat> you have a power law t to the eta where eta is between zero and one. Um, just uh, so you see uh, things are going on in space and time. So another alternative view is like a three dimensional picture, which I'm just showing you quickly now, uh, where you have space here uh, on top and time as the z axis, you start at the center and in this finite speed case, you grow a um, you know, simple cone. <clears throat> in this power law case, you start to see distinct sub outbreaks over time. And uh, you know, they are everywhere in this uh, kind of metastatic case. So for all these cases, we actually, um, it is possible to understand these asymptotic behaviors based on a rather simple um, real space, um, almost randomization group argument, um, which is very geometric in nature. So my goal next is in the next couple of slides to, to, to give you that argument. Uh, unless there are any question about the simulations or so, but I don't see any. Okay, so, so this, what I've shown you here uh, already is the space time view. That's actually uh, quite useful uh, also for thinking about, I would say, the crucial part uh, of this spatial temporal dynamics. Uh, let me move here. Still right. Okay. So um, I want to think about the epidemic as starting here at the origin. Um, the x-axis is space, the y-axis is time, and space is just simplified as one dimensional now. Uh, and I want to assume that the epidemic is uh, faster than linear. That's why uh, the border here has this curved shape, right? Because the epidemic is growing faster than, uh, than linear. And I should also point out what this funnel really uh, indicates. It is, uh, we call it the, the core. It indicates the sites that um, after a, a time t um, are occupied with a high probability, with a probability of order one. Right? That doesn't mean that outside of this core, there is no infection at all. In, any, in fact, in any realization, there will be also outbreaks out here. But on average, this will be a very dilute region. Right? So we, we want to assume we have such a structure. And then we want to ask, ultimately, uh, under what conditions is this structure self-consistent with the kernel that I provide? Okay, um, so let's think about what jumps are um, doing in this context, um, the jumps that we implement in the simulations. So here's an example uh, where a jump starts in the core and also ends in the core. And such a jump, of course, is inconsequential because um, the target site is already occupied, right? So nothing will happen there. Alternatively, you might have a jump that starts in the core and then reaches out of the core. That in turn has a big impact because it's like a new seed 
<clears throat> which can generate another little epidemic at that target location. So if space and time is homogeneous, which I want to assume here, then what I have to do is I have to copy and paste uh, the funnel that I've drawn to that new location. And that would be the resulting sub outbreak um, until it kind of merges with the, with the original one. But what you see um, is um, by, by doing this move, what we have achieved in this particular case is we have, um, we have infected you know, many sites, but including this gray circle. This is, the, this is a point I wanna focus on now to formulate the self-consistency argument, right? So I wanna focus on the gray circle, which is uh, the most distant location uh, that is infected at the time T with high probability. And we wanna ask, okay, by what pathways, by what transmission chains can we get this gray circle uh, to be infected? And one transmission chain here relies on this particular jump that I've drawn. Uh, of course, the probability of this particular path is gonna be uh, zero weight, right? Because it relies on this particular jump. But there are many other ways of getting the gray circle uh, infected. This is one where you get an early large jump. Uh, here's another one. If you think systematically about all the jumps uh, that would generate a sub outbreak that contains the gray circle, you find uh, this blue area here, which I call uh, the target funnel. Um, so this target funnel has the property that when you start a sub outbreak in here, it will contain, the sub outbreak will contain the gray circle. And what's interesting about it is it has exactly the same shape as the red funnel, except that it's flipped in time so that you get a, a time symmetric uh, picture here. Um, and uh, well, you can convince yourself uh, that this is true by essentially in your head, sliding the source funnel um, up and down along the boundary of the target funnel, then the forward funnel needs to always <coughs> intersect the gray circle with its right boundary. And for this to be the case, you know, the target funnel must have the same shape except flipped in time. And because of that, now you see how a gap opened up between these two um, areas. And this is a gap over which you have to jump in order to infect the gray circle, right? And so now I'm in the position to, to really formulate that self-consistency argument because uh, I can now say, okay, suppose we, we make the assumption this, this funnel that I've drawn is the one that generates the epidemic, is the correct core funnel, has the correct shape. Well, then uh, I can check whether it's consistent because I can now estimate or calculate the, the expected number of jumps from the source funnel to this blue target funnel. And if I find that the expected number of jumps is much less than one, uh, well, then it's inconsistent because that means it's actually with a very low probability you will generate such a jump that could lead to the infection of the gray circle. So it cannot be that this gray circle is actually occupied with a high probability. And you can also make the reverse argument, you know, if the jumps are too large in number, um, then the proposed funnel is probably too small. So you can say, and this is now <clears throat> in essence the argument that we expect, well, that we want or demand that the expected number of jumps from source to target funnel should be of order one for any proposed um, uh, growth curve uh, to be consistent. Um, of course, this number just needs to be of order one, but it turns out you don't need to fix that number precisely. This gives you uh, the leading order um, behavior of, uh, of the epidemic. Now the rest of this is, uh, is math. Um, and maybe let me just um, check the equations. Uh, sorry, the questions. A couple of questions in the chat. Why do you choose only three number for exponent of kernel jump? I, I don't understand that question. I think I think you you had an illust 
actually, let's go back a little bit. The, okay. You gave, a, you gave an illustration with three different values. And I assume that was just for illustration purposes. This is just for illustration. Absolutely right. And, yeah. then, and then also on this same uh, one, the, I guess in some way, the, the notion that the infinite variance case does something different than the finite variance case, maybe not, to, I mean, that somehow feels right. But the, the idea that, that um, this uh, faster than linear power law saturates it being linear, right? That you don't get, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't become slower than linear. It doesn't, I mean, you, right? The thing that you've written down under the power law, you could imagine plugging in mu equals 3.5, but then you get the wrong answer. So there's some. Uh, then you get the wrong answer, that's right. So, so there's some transition in here that isn't, isn't obvious, right? Exactly, exactly. I mentioned the infinite variance. The, I talked about variance briefly because, you know, there's this well-known phenomenon of just, uh, of levy walks, where you just ask, um, you know, how far does a random walker distance uh, itself from the origin if you allow the random walker to take, uh, you know, to take jumps that are drawn from a broad distribution. And um, you, you find a deviation from diffusive behavior, long-term diffusive behavior only if uh, this jump kernel has a diverging variance. That's when you start to see new behavior. That's, um, and, and, and some, some people, when I give this, this talk, um, you say, oh, okay, of course you get new behavior when the variance becomes infinite, but you actually already get interesting behavior, even though the variance is, uh, is, is finite. That's, that demonstrates the middle case. In fact, in higher dimensions, these questions are totally decoupled. The reason being is that here you have not only a um, problem of uh, migration and movement, but also of growth. Uh, and that makes the, the, the difference. Good, so I, th I think we should let you go get to the end of this section before the some okay. some of the questions will be will be solved. So okay. if you could go. <clears throat> so um, so the rest you know the rest of the argument is turning this um, what I've written down here into math. So I just indicate the the key steps here. Uh, well, first you need to integrate um, essentially the entire. Um, you need to calculate the expected number of jumps. For this way, for this, you need a time integral because the jump can happen anywhere from zero to t. You need to integrate uh, over a space. You have two space integrals, one for the source funnel, one for the target funnel. And what you need to integrate over is a, is a jump kernel, the rate of jumping a particular distance. Um, and that actually constrains the dynamics quite fully because you have one equation for every um, time t. So it constrains it up to the initial condition, the conditions, but it's uh, quite unwieldy because, well, it's an integral equation. But what helps you is that on long times, if you have a fast growing funnel, um, well, if you have a funnel that's growing slower than exponentially, uh, but faster than linearly, uh, in this case, you actually develop a pronounced um, maximum in the time integral. And by symmetry, by the time symmetry that I mentioned, this maximum has to be exactly at half time. Um, um, and that allows you then to carry out a saddle point approximation to this integral, which makes it much easier. Um, and you might even be able to do this by just looking at this equation. So for the saddle point approximation, what you get then is um, for the kernel, the kernel uh, we evaluate just essentially for um, the um, at the time t, so it's a, it's a kernel evaluated at L of t, because the it turns out that the regimes we're looking at, the size of these funnels at half time are so much smaller that the si than the size of the funnel at time t, that you know, the jump you need to carry out at half time is essentially of size roughly L of t with a tiny correction, which, we, which I'm going to ignore. So I'm evaluating the kernel at L of t. Then from the, from the space integral, I get the volumes of, the, of these funnels at half time. Because they are identical there, the volume squared, and then I get the time integral. 
Uh, so that's what I'm showing you here, right? So it's a kernel evaluated uh, for L of T. Uh, this is the volume of the funnel uh, at half time squared. And here, factor of time for dimensional reasons. Um, and that's it. And that's, that now looks like a recurrence relation, right? Where, uh, which says that once, once I know how large the, uh, the funnel is at half time, the epidemic is at half time, I can predict what it should be at twice that time if I know the kernel. Uh, and now that can be analyzed um, for different kinds of kernels. And a nice way to classify behaviors is actually assuming that the kernel for large distances uh, has a power law shape. Because then you can precisely reproduce the behaviors that I've shown you in uh, the simulations. So um, first of all, if mu is larger than d plus one, uh, d being the number of dimensions, uh, then you get wave-like growth, right? So, so that's already kind of interesting um, because it was predicted to be exponential no matter what power law you have. Um, then between d plus one and d, it's power law growth uh, faster than linear and below that stretched exponential growth. And in between you have interesting marginal cases <coughs> Um, which turn out to be very important if you go beyond the asymptotics, because it actually turns out in simulations and in real life, I'm sure it's very hard to reach these asymptotics. Uh, so if you look at finite time, um, the, these marginal cases actually blow up and become very important intermediate asymptotics. And in simulations, it's actually pretty hard to escape these intermediate asymptotic behaviors. Uh, so it, I like particularly this, uh, this one here, which is kind of the threshold between um, power law, slowish growth, and already pretty fast stretched exponential growth. So in between you have this nice behavior of t to the power of log t. Um, and and that's, that's the picture that we end up with. Um, well, Black Death somehow must be here. Modern human travel, if you look at the dollar bill data, is, is deep in the... Um, in the regime of stretched exponential growth. Um, maybe not surprising because you can, you can turn this model into a model for transport of humans. Um, and um, if you wanna be um, you know, fast, if you wanna be able to fast go from one place, let's say from, from Berkeley to New York, then you need to be able to, um, to, to take a series of jumps that after, you know, that by just taking a few links, uh, you get there. You don't want to travel forever, right? So the, so one argument, you know, one reason for modern human travel to be here could simply be that, you know, our human transport, we want to have it efficient and that's why we are in this regime. There's also some connection between, uh, to um, perhaps um, the distribution of synaptic connection uh, in, in the brain um, and then we would like to, you know, look closer at uh, the data of the pandemic. We are not as far yet. What I'm showing you here uh, is to be taken with a grain of salt. This is just looking at um, the initial rise of the cases in, you know, a number of countries we know and love, United States, Switzerland, Kingdom, so the big one, big Western countries. Uh, are, the, are, are part of that. And what I'm plotting here is um, the rise of the uh, number of cases once it, it exceeded one case per million for, for each of these countries and on, on a semi-logarithmic plot. And what you see is these curves. So these are all confirmed cases. And what you see is they, well, they didn't grow exponentially uh, but slower than that. Um, and actually they are not far from uh, the marginal case. Um, so the, the mu that we would predict here uh, is, is, would be 1.75. In fact, the mean uh, dashed line here can be turned into an inference of uh, the jump kernel, um, which, I, which I'm doing here. Uh, which, which gives you this result, 1.75. That's actually how we uh, um, ended up with this. Okay, so um, 
so that this is essentially what I wanted to say about um, this, the spreading dynamics, and which I want to now conclude. I, but I see Bill, so maybe you want to ask a question. Or... Yeah. So there's uh, it's come up a couple of times in the chat, and I think that that I'm also curious about it. So the the example you're studying is one which, as you say, is homogeneous in space and time, and for things that are carried by by airplane, you can sort of understand this. On the other hand, if you think about um, microbial populations or something like this, you feel like uh, the guys in the middle of a cluster have just different behavior than the guys at the edge, including the distribution of their probability. I mean, it's sort of hard for them. The guy at the edge could, in his lifetime, go some distance. The guy in the middle might have trouble doing that. Right. So it, is there? Yeah, that's one, that, that's an important point. So there are many, as, as I said initially, you know, there, there's just one well-mixed structure, but there are many spatial structures you can consider. We started here, what I depicted here is the simplest one, we say homogeneous in space and time. Um, and you end up with this time symmetric picture. What, you, what you're just describing is a case where, um, where you break that symmetry, which in, in that sense is already a very interesting question because kind of in the source funnel then you would say, okay, in the core, I don't want to generate jumps because because they are kind of their jumps are suppressed, um, and that that modifies this picture. Um, and we, ha I haven't analyzed this in the context of uh, of microbial colonies, but where it's very important is say if you have an epidemic, where you know after being infected maybe for a short period of time you you become resistant. Then it's also the case that in your source fun funnel. You want to have, you know, want to make sure that the guys in the center, which had it for a long time, become resistant. So really, the picture of the of these two funnels changes. You burn a hole into the source funnel, and that change that uh, that breaks that time symmetry and uh, changes part of the picture. It is, you know, this stretch exponential growth regime is surprisingly robust uh, to to what a to the symmetry breaking, but. Uh, this power law growth regime is quite sensitive to that. Good. Um, there's a question which I, I admit I don't quite understand. Uh, so, so somewhere back here, there was also a question about um, if you jump but don't survive um, uh, for some reason. Um, I guess if I guess if there's just some finite probability of that happening, then everything is okay, right? I mean, just, that just that, multiplies right. so all. It doesn't change the scale. Right. So um, if you have here, um, if the microscopic model is a birth death model, right, where you would say, okay, um, maybe um, an infected is jumping to a new location, but uh, then at first it's super small. And by chance, you know, the local outbreak might just die out, right? Uh, and, and, and so how do you incorporate that? Well, in, in, in what I've described to you, we would just renormalize the jump kernel and say, okay, it just describes the successful seeding events, right? Um, that's, that's how we would incorporate it. So it doesn't change the, 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 the phase diagram. So, so there's a... I guess another another version of the same question, um, which is that in some way the the process you're describing has a kind of is is sort of supercritical, and that you know there's That's right. death is is not so is sufficiently small that things just spread, and right. and the question is is there a is there an interesting critical behavior as you, if you think about doing something well like an epidemic with controlled spread. Or more generally, if you have death or resistance, yeah, I'm sure there is um, a, a an interesting uh, critical scenario here. So, if you have just short range migration, and you have a simple SI model, um, there you have also a um, a critical scenario where you say, <clears throat> okay, below a certain rate of infectivity or um, dispersal rate, you go extinct. 
And that critical behavior has something to do with what's called directed percolation. Um, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a well um, understood uh, universality class, uh, even though it's actually still not understood analytically in even one dimensions, which is kind of curious. Um, with long range migration, um, I, I wanted to dig into that literature. I haven't found yet um, um, the long range version of that, but you know, it might exist. So it's a, definitely, it's an interesting uh, problem. Good. Okay. Um, okay. Shall I, uh, so let, let me conclude, maybe after the conclusion I can look again into the spread, maybe new things have come up. So to conclude, you know, if you ignore, if you, if you, tri if you try to describe um, the model that I've depicted uh, using a deterministic reaction, that uh, a, a deterministic model that uh, incorporates a reaction and these jumps, um, but ignores the randomness of the jumps, then what you find is there can only be two behaviors, um, exponential or um, uh, more rapidly decaying kernels give rise to um, wave-like spread. You know, the so-called um, fischer kolmogorov equation is in this regime. Um, but if you have kernels that are broader than exponential, you invariably, sorry, that are, yeah, that are, that are less rapidly decaying than an exponential decay with distance, they would generate um, exponential growth. Well, um, in fact, there is now this also these noise dominated regimes, um, which I uh, described to you, um, which we characterized for um, these power law kernels. You don't have to, you know, the, the, the recurrence relation is more general than that. So you don't have to assume it's a power law kernel. It's just a situation where you can easily classify behaviors. But really the most important take home mass question, uh, sorry, take home um, message which I think is general, is the one about the statistics of the chain of transmissions. So remember that in this regime that I uh, outlined here, um, on the transmission chain that leads all the way up to this gray circle, the rarest event that happens actually with relatively predictably it must happen as ha at half time. It's this very long jump that has to happen as at half time. <clears throat> and uh, you can actually um, you know, iterate that argument and figure out there's a hierarchy of jumps of decaying rareness, um, which happen you know, at these half time intervals, which uh, should characterize um, these dynamics. And whether it's exactly at half time and so on, it's not so clear, but there's a, but there's a discrete set of rare seeding events. That's, I think, an important take home question, a take home message. And it follows a hierarchy of scales. And, and that's also important because, <clears throat> well, it, um, it shapes the statistical structure of um, the infection chains and the infection trees, really, you know, the type that. Um, Richard uh, has shown um, in his talk, which, which perhaps one can infer uh, from uh, genomic data. And also forward in time, if you introduce mutations in this process of spreading, then um, the, the, the spatial temporal patterns that you see um, actually are quite sensitive to, to um, the, the statistical structure of uh, transmission chains. So if um, everything is wave-like, what you end up with is these sector-like patterns, which we actually can reproduce in experiments. But when you know, the, jump, you know, the jump kernel gets broader and broader, you um, turn into here characteristics backup pattern, which have, have characteristic size distributions, uh, which if you're interested in that, uh, we've described recently in this, um, paper with Jason Paulos. Um, there are definitely um, interesting extensions uh, and they're potentially important. So one is local dynamics. So I made here a time scale separation in my model. I assumed that once uh, you know, a seed enters a lattice site, it fills it immediately. 
So which suggests that, you know, I'm looking at scales and time scales that are much, much larger than the time to, um, to increase locally the density. That's not quite the case, um, of course, for our current pandemic. Uh, so you wanna generalize that. And it turns out that can be done. And the pattern is quite similar as long as the local dynamics is kind of slowing down, is not like strictly exponential is bad. If you have local dynamics that strictly exponential, that will also generate a global dynamics, which is exponential. But if locally you are slowing down, you then transition to uh, the regimes that I had um, indicated. Then inhomogeneity is in space and time, right? We have, of course, population densities are strongly variable uh, in space, but also in time, if you think about epidemics, of course, people are adapting their behaviors, their social distancing that is um, coming in uh, later than earlier, unfortunately. And, um, and that has, of course, consequences for the way this is um, uh, spreading. Um, then I think a more general question, which we're quite interested in is, um, what are the consequences for long-term evolution? So, so I, I described the spreading process more in the context of epidemic, epidemics, but it's also, <clears throat> it's a simple model. And the beauty of it, of simple models is that they are often general, right? They can be applied to different systems as well, with different contexts. And the different context is, um, let's say a beneficial mutation arises in a population that engages in long range dispersal then such a beneficial mutation, if it's successful, will spread in the patterns that I've described. And if that's the case, then we might wonder there, how does you know, adaptation work? What's the dynamics of adaptation? So think about back to Ivana's models. If locally a beneficial mutation is not rising exponentially, but uh, more following uh, the laws that I've described here, maybe with a stretched exponential law, um, will the long-term behavior be different or essentially the same is an open question. Okay, so this is the first part um, of my talk. And uh, now I would transition to the second part, uh, which is closer to experiments. Um, let me look at the chat, if there's something has come up. But I don't think... Uh, I, think I think you're actually caught up. Good, good. So <clears throat> what I've described here was unbounded growth um, of a population. Um, now I want to transition to a situation where um, the growth uh, cannot unfold in an unbounded way because it has to happen in a finite uh, spatial um, setting. Um, of course, we, we still want to have growth, right? If you're interested in evolution, we need birth events. And somehow, uh, then over long times, the, the individuals that we generate, generate need to be removed. Um, most of the work has gone into thinking about, okay, all the people we create are removed by death. But there are other ways of removing them. One is to flush them out in a spatial context that will be relevant in, what I'm talking now, which is essentially our guts. We are flushing out uh, bacteria out of our guts. And that's how they effectively die uh, most of the time. And I am going to focus in particular on situations where microbes grow in, uh, let's say, tiny confined spaces, which uh, has been shown in a couple of contexts. So here's the first one. So we all have in our colon uh, crypts, um, here is it, it is shown, especially for, uh, for, for mice, which is kind of a model system where you can do experiments. Um, these are invaginations that have, uh, you know, width on the order of 50 microns uh, or smaller. Here's an actual uh, um, micrograph of these, of these crypts, uh, and here's just a schematic. And what has been shown is that you know, they are really good colonizers for these crypts that go uh, after these crypts. Here um, is uh, the species Bacteroides frag fragilis, <clears throat> which is kind of a, quite a common uh, micro species in the microbiome uh, also of us. Another uh, example is um, in the fly, which 
uh, where you can do actually nice microscopy on uh, the gut, on the microbiome inside uh, the, the gut of the fly. And there you find that in the cardia of the fly, which are kind of <clears throat> folds in the gut of the fly, which think of elongated version of these crypts, you find a tightly packed uh, populations of um, bacteria, in this case, Lactobacillus plantarum. Um, down here is an electron micrograph where you see how tightly packed these bacteria become close uh, down into these folds. Um, another example uh, might be, um, is, uh, are the different kinds of glands that we have in our skin, like sweat glands and sebaceous glands. They can become um, packed with lots of stuff, but also with uh, bacteria uh, that grow in there. And if you think about crowdedness, it's not necessarily something that bacteria should strive for because, you know, they are competing for space and for nutrients. Um, but there can also be advantages. And one important clue came from uh, this work here, Li et al, uh, 2013, because they could show that um, when you first, when you take a germ-free mouse uh, with no bacteria in them, and then you colonize them with the strain Bacteroides fragilis uh, first, and then you, you try to bring in another type um, um, and kick the resident out, then this is almost impossible. So, um, so it seems that you know, these bacteria that manage to um, colonize these crypts, they, have a, you know, they, they can hardly be outcompeted. Right, so the, this spatial structure seems to have an impact on competition with invaders and perhaps as well with mutants, right? In that sense, it could be interesting for evolution. So perhaps to, to general, the, generalize <clears throat> this hypothesis, we might, uh, I want to refer back to, to this violent scenario here of um, the Battle of the Thermopylae, uh, where the Spartans, um, also use the topography, topography of their surroundings to have an advantage against um, a superior invader, which were the Persians, right? Um, so um, the Spartans then knew their country well um, and found a narrow mountain path, and that's where they waited for the Persians uh, to come. And, you know, in there, they had the strategy to essentially exploit the topography and were able to resist uh, the invaders, not forever, well, not unfortunately, but for seven days. And so the question is, do bacteria do that uh, as well? And under what conditions? Uh, and what ultimately will this competition mean for natural selection? That, that would be the, 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 the big questions that I wanna ask. But to answer them, we, uh, we need to look you know, at the right scale, right? So this is kind of already indicated um, maybe in these, in these pictures. If you look at these pictures, you know, the, the painter um, has drawn, has are depicting the scene on the scale of uh, not only of the, of the fighters, but also of the surrounding topography uh, so that you see the fighters and the fighting and the, and the landscape. And we want to do that as well with bacteria. And that's of course super hard in, in vitro Perhaps you can do it in the fly, but you can't really perturb, um, you know, the, the gut of the fly to see whether whatever you're theorizing might be correct. So you want to go in vitro. And that's the point where the hero of my story comes in, which is Yuya Karita. Uh, he's a very talented uh, grad student in my group. And all I'm telling you now is unpublished. Um, so he, <coughs> came up with this uh, really simple, but I think beautiful uh, microfluidic device where um, you have one main channel, which brings in mostly nutrients and few uh, bacterial cells. And these cells then, uh, you know, see these imaginations and can go in there and colonize these imaginations. Um, you know, this, this kind of device is actually similar, um, you know, having invaginations to a supply channel is, is quite similar to something which is called the mother machine and very well known. But the only new feature here, uh, and a, but a crucial feature, is that we, um, 
that you are here vary the length of these pipes of, of these of these chambers right so he systematically varied the length of the chambers so that we can systematic systematically look at the dynamics across uh, across length scales and um, this device actually to, to us looks like a pan flute. That's why we call it the microfluidic pan flute. And I want to convince you that there's also mu scientific music can come out of that pan flute. Uh, to start, um, let's, let's look at a, um, a snapshot, just a snapshot of what happens to the colonization of this device when we bring in <clears throat> this strain here, Acetobacter indonesiensis, which is derived actually from the fly gut by our collaborator, Will Luddington. Um, at steady state, this is what you, uh, what you see. So first of all, you see here these, these first um, pipes of the pan flute, which are essentially empty. So apparently the bacteria are not quite able to colonize those. But at a certain point, colonization st starts to become possible uh, with this pipe, maybe already here, hard to say, but certainly with this pipe, and then um, the population size increases. So there seems to be an onset transition for colonization. These pipes somehow need to be large enough. And that's the first thing I, uh, I, I wanna uh, discuss and, um, and actually model, right? So, so what's, what one nice thing about um, uh, the situation here is that uh, these bacteria are non-motile so all they do here is passively move around uh, and perhaps stick to, uh, to one another um, and uh, they grow. And growth is really um, constant everywhere here. We have different ways of checking and we can essentially, we have convinced ourselves that the growth rates are um, you know, not really dependent on these densities here because the scales are so small and diffusion so efficient. So with that, uh, the way we want to, you know, the simplest way to describe the population dynamics uh, is the following. I have something I wanted to point out. So kind of in the first pipe where we see colonization, uh, the population seems to um, assume a certain, characteristic scale, LC, and that's one of the things we want to explain. Okay, so the simplest way perhaps to describe uh, this population uh, in, in this pipe is to say, okay, let's ignore the movement in the horizontal axis and just look at the uh, vertical uh, dynamics in, in 1D and try to describe um, the dynamics by a reaction diffusion system. Um, so that excludes immediately uh, the part where you actually have flow. So it turns out, right, so in this upper supply channel, you do have flow. We, because we apply small amounts of flow to bring in nutrients and, you know, the flow lines, they reach into the pipes and swipe out everything that's in there, right? So up here, we have maybe a complicated fluid dynamics problem to solve, but on the other hand, it's quite simple because it simply em empties there. there. Um, down here where we actually have cells, movement is uh, really just diffusive and we can convince ourselves by uh, tracking cells there. So if we uh, contend ourselves to describing just this lower part up to zero, between zero and L, then uh, we can formulate the reaction diffusion uh, equation as follows. So the rate of change of the density at position X and time T then is controlled by two terms. Uh, one is, is, is growth, which is exponential with rate R, and the other one is diffusion. Um, right, simple linear equation. And importantly, we have natural boundary conditions. Um, once the cells reach X equal to zero, that's up here, they're going to be washed out. So we want the density there to be zero. Uh, when the density uh, at the wall, <clears throat> we, want, we want the gradient here to disappear so that there's no current into the wall. And when you analyze that equation, you, it's very simple. What you find is that when uh, L is smaller than LC, um, the, even the largest 
growing mode, the, 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 the fastest growing mode has a negative growth rate, meaning that uh, you go extinct, right? So for L smaller than LC, uh, the fate is extinction. Because our equation is linear, it also means that when L is larger than LC, you, you start to develop a fastest growing mode with a cosine shape that uh, would never stop growing, which is of course wrong because there must be a nonlinearity in the system, which I'll talk about later. Um, but we can first estimate this LC. So we measure the diffusion constant of the cells, the growth rate, and uh, this LC value comes out um, quite, quite well. And moreover, actually we can, we can measure the density profiles in our pipes. So these are the density profiles in different pipes. Four is the largest one. So this is certainly not a cosine profile, but the first one uh, quite nicely follows the cosine profile up until the lowest densities. We start to see actually the two dimensional structure and you know, the impact of the flow lines. Okay. But then the next question is, so what I've described so far is the onset of growth, but what happens um, beyond this onset in the supercritical case is I think um, even more interesting. So for that, I wanna show you now um, a movie. So now you see a time-lapse movie, um, how uh, the cells are growing in the supercritical pipes of our pan fluid. So here on the left, <clears throat> you see what you might have expected. Okay, now you get a population that's getting denser and denser, but this is really just gradually changing. Um, and you see a lot of movement, a lot of diffusion. But then something interesting happens uh, from this pipe to the next, um, kind of suddenly by just changing the lengths by a tiny bit, um, you acquire a substantial fraction of highly, highly dense, uh, highly dense bacterial phase. In fact, you can convince yourself that they're essentially jam packed there. Uh, and up here, you still have a gas-like phase, but what's kind of interesting is that you have a small change in design, big change in behavior. So there seems to be a discontinuous uh, jamming transition. And to-, well, to Oscar, yeah. while, you have, while you have this up, um, Somebody asked if you look at it, if you look at these, it, it seems like sort of one third of the way down from the top, there there seems to be a, a decrease in density. Or yeah, it, so it, this it's is uh, the bottom, and then it, it's not it's not it doesn't look monotonic. Yeah, so this has to do I, I think with the flow. Um, so so up there, I think here is uh, near the top. I think the density is increasing because you know cells are are, uh, are traveling with the flow lines, um, and somehow in this flow line regime, somehow the density is increased, um, and then underneath that, um, it's uh, it's more dilute. Um, yeah. So th the short answer is these are relatively new experiments and. Um, the pandemic, unfortunately, didn't allow us to do them in the best possible way or repeat them in the best possible way, let's say to minimize the cells that are here in this flow line regime. But um, I agree, it's a little bit surprising why up here you have this non-monotonous behavior. But the, our description mostly um, is focused on the regime where you have diffusion, where diffusion is dominating. Okay, and the another question was, if you, if, if the description so far would suggest that if you flowed the other way, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. It, that... it doesn't, and we, we do it both ways. So the, um, okay. actually in this case, I don't know which way it's going. Um, okay. But we convinced ourselves, we have the, the device has both directions um, of, of these pan flutes and uh, it works both ways. And, and again, the bacteria themselves are not motile. Mm -hmm. So there's no chemotaxis or anything, nope. right? Is that right? That's right. Okay. Good. Okay, so we try to describe the supercritical regime now, right? We have growth, but something needs to limit uh, the densities and somehow 
the different pipes reach the limiting reach very different limiting densities and with a big jump here from uh, this particular pipe to this one. So what is the nonlinearity that controls these limiting densities? The, you know, the natural instinct would be to say, ah, density, as you increase the density, the growth rate goes down. But in fact, we can measure the growth rate quite well. Actually by PIV in these jammed regions, you can perhaps um, in, envision this yourself. You have here these, for instance, fiducial markers. You can just follow how fast they are growing upstream. And from that you can, uh, assuming close packing, you can turn it into a growth rate and it's really the same growth rate up to our measurement error than in the dilute case. And that's also expected given uh, how fast the fusion is uh, in this context. So the growth rate is actually not able to explain uh, the supercritical behavior. So the nonlinearity must be in the way these bacteria are migrating. And as I said, they are non-motile. So it's actually in the passive diffusion of these particles, right? So the way, oh, before I go on, here's a nice uh, dynamical movie in a very long pipe where you see you know, sudden onset of this jamming transition and then a wave running through. Okay, so, so we now say, okay, and more generally, we wanna describe the system still by a reaction diffusion system. We don't fool around with the growth term, but we say now that the diffusivity is actually a function of uh, the density. Uh, let me call that D tilde of C. And in fact, if, um, if these particles are passive, which they are, um, then you can decompose this diffusivity. By the way, uh, the diffusivity I need here in this equation is the collective diffusion constant that describes how gradients of densities turn into currents. And that's important because later I talk about something called self-diffusion. Here, what we need is a collective diffusion constant. One can show that, it's, uh, that it can be decomposed into two components that can be nicely interpreted. The first one is a transport coefficient, gamma of C, which tells you given you have a gradient in, uh, in pressure, so given you have some forces that, that push the bacteria, how much flow do you get? What's the flow velocity? And that's actually, proportional to what's called the sedimentation velocity um, of these uh, particles, right? Sedimentation means gravity is pulling on um, a collection of particles downward and you wanna know what's the steady state velocity of these particles. It's a complicated function of the density and it's, there's big literature about trying to figure out what that sedimentation velocity is because it's like cooperative, these different particles, they, um, um, perturb each other's flow lines. Um, and then the second term here, the gradient of this osmotic pressure is like a bulk modulus. So it tells you how hard it, how hard or easy it is to, to compress um, the packing of these cells. Now, um, as I said, these are difficult quantities to, um, to, to model uh, and even measure separately. And it's hard to know how the behavior of the product of the uh, two is. We just know the transport coefficient probably goes down because the larger the density, right, the more there are traffic jams and uh, sedimentation will be slower. Pressure will have to go up with density, but what the product does is, is unclear at this point. So we take a different approach and we say, given we know what this function D of C is, and that's here the, the, the important point. It's, it's a function just dependent on density and not on position or time. Can we say something about the behavior at steady state? And it turns out you can, because at steady state, where we set the gradient here, the time derivative to zero, this turns into a mechanical problem where C of X described a, describes a point mass sliding down a hill, the hill describing um, you know, a potential energy function which depends on this D tilde of C. And what you find then is in order to generate the behavior that we see in the experiment, what you need is that um, D tilde of C um, needs to be non-monotonous. Only then you can drive this discontinuous jamming transition here that we observed. 
So uh, here's an example of such a behavior. And just intuitively, what might be going on here, just to give you some intuition, is the following. Uh, you can imagine that uh, if you have a fluctuation and the density of the cells is increasing, um, and as a result of that, the diffusivity of the cells goes down, that means fewer cells are leaving the pipe by means of diffusion. Um, as a result, then, uh, you shift the balance uh, and you, you get even more dense, which lowers the diffusivity even more, and so on. So you get this positive feedback until um, it can only uh, stop at this, you know, at the jamming transition where you're, you're fully packed. And here is an example of that. So we don't, okay. Detailed of C can become non-monotonous -monot for, for various reasons. I'm just mentioning here two cellular traffic jams, cells bumping into each other, but also if cells are sticky, that can also drive, uh, you know, a decrease of the diffusivity with increasing um, density. Um, but now I'm illustrating you what would happen if we had that such a situation uh, and that we can calculate. So here I'm assuming now, suppose our diffusivity as a function of density has this parabolic shape that's just assumed, not measured at this point. We're measuring this stuff right now. What we would predict here is the following. So I'm focusing on the quant quantity of the density here at the floor. And that's the maximum density in our pipes. Um, as a function of this ratio L over LC, LC is this critical length where you get onset of growth. And we want to change that ratio. We can do it by either increasing the length of the pipe or changing LC, which you can do by changing the growth rate. So if you increase the growth rate, you lower LC, you increase this ratio. What you then would do, you follow this red line. You, you stay on this <clears throat> stable branch up until a certain critical ratio of this L over LC, and then you suddenly jump, uh, or the, yeah, the density snaps up to the highest possible density, which is the jamming density, where everything is closely uh, close packed. Um, just to illustrate that we can, you know, as I said, we can solve this mechanical analogy. And for this diffusion profile, at this particular transition point, I can calculate the density as a function of position in this pipe, uh, exactly. And so the, the state down here, which is still gas-like, has this continuous behavior. Density as a function position, it's zero at the outlet, and then uh, gradually increases. And then it snaps at some point to this jammed state where you have this kink here um, at, some, at some position. Um, what's nice is you also get another prediction, which is that if you now turn around at this point and again, decrease the growth rate, you lower the ratio L over LC, uh, you would follow this upper stable branch up until a different point and jump at a different place, right? So there's, the prediction is there should be some hysteresis in a region where you have actually bistability. Can we test that? In fact, um, we can. Bill, you should just tell me when I should answer any of these questions. Um, there are a number. I think actually they're they're kind of answering themselves, uh, oh, right. each other or something. Perfect. So I guess yes. Yeah, CS, it, you, with the little subscript S, just remind us you're talking about a steady state, um, and then other than that, you're caught up. So okay, cool. Okay, so now let's test this um, uh, the hysteresis. So I first. First, we, we have a growth rate upshift in this experiment. I, I run the movie uh, again in a second. So what we do here is we, we start from a steady state at um, you know, some given temperature, and then we increase the growth rates um, by, by increasing the temperature a little bit. And that, um, that changes the steady state um, distribution in these pipes. Uh, so the resolution is unfortunately not great, but you can perhaps see that in the left picture, it's very dense here, only in the left pipe. So this pipe is jammed. And after the growth rate upshift, you know, it's creeping in to these other pipes. This one is certainly jammed as well. Uh, I run the movie again. You know, this shows you how uh, it, you know, the dynamics relaxes. And then we go down with the growth rate from the state um, back to the original temperature. 
and there the steady state is um, uh, well again so the upper pipes here they have become gas-like dilute but uh, we have now one more pipe which is highly dense and which is uh, kind of jammed so indicating that this particular pipe here seems to be in that bistable region okay so um, now I can finally talk about uh, competition and I, sh I should maybe speed up so that we can come to an end. Um, so we, we have described these different phases of growth in uh, the spatial, spatially confined context. Now you, want, might not, uh, you might ask, okay, how does that impact competition against invaders? Um, ultimately, or this is what you is doing right now, is actually bringing in other species to see how invasion works. But the first thing we tried, which is also relevant for evolution, is to look at different types of the same species, right? You could consider one being a mutant, the other one being wild type. Mutant here being green, wild type being, being dark in the, in the following. Uh, what happens to them? So we start with a mixture and then see, uh, look at the dynamics, and this is the dynamics. Um, it's going to loop, but let, let's start here with the jammed cases. So you see here, these two are completely dark and, and here you have a dark stripe in, in, a, in a green region. Uh, it loops again. You see now that the initially present diversity in these jammed um, parts is quickly flushed out. Uh, and you only get diversity in pipes like this one if you have diversity actually at the floor of the pipes. Only these guys can really leave ancestors uh, uh, in, in the chambers. The reason being that, and now the term is important, self-diffusion is super low in this context, right? So the, the cells diffuse very little with respect to their neighbors, which means that they just are getting flushed out of the, of the chamber. Uh, it's, it's practically impossible for um, a mutant type to arise up here and go against the stream and take over this population. So effectively the population is super small that is competing with one another, even though the population size itself is not so small. That's very different in these gas-like um, stages, uh, phases, where you see very, um, um, very vigorous diffusion in up and down, left and right, and that allows, you know, also mutants to, to maybe take over or reach the floor from higher up. In fact, we can quantify this by, well, measuring self-diffusion in this context. We track the cells. We measure, you know, the mean square displacement as a function of time. And in the gas phase, we, we find diffusivities that are very, very close to, you know, the, just the free diffusivity the self-diffusion of these labeled markers, which is like 30 microns squared per hour. Uh, in, this, um, in these dense phases, it's hard uh, to do these single cell tracking experiments, but you can look at these, uh, at these bands and look at their fluctuations to infer what the self-diffusion must be. And it's as low as you can imagine, uh, just one micron per hour, which is, corresponds to roughly one cell diameter squared per cell division, which I would guess is essentially the lower bound of this. And from these diffusivities, you can derive a length scale squared of diffusivity over growth rate, which tells you essentially the region where cells have a chance to, to fight essentially for, the, for becoming, you know, for invading uh, the pipe. So you need to be in this blue region in the gas phase, um, which is, okay, it's not the entire pipe, but it's much larger than, you know, this narrow band uh, in the case of the, of the jammed uh, region. So that really has a big impact on competition, either with invaders that come you know, from the outlet and try to come down here. It's nearly impossible in the jammed case. Uh, also hard in the uh, diffusive case, sorry, in the, in the gas-like phase. But even if you think uh, downhill, this is something we, we, we want to test. When you have, let's say, mutations coming up, maybe spontaneously, um, under which conditions can they take over? How can a beneficial mutation take over in such a scenario? It's very hard in the jammed case because you have to arise here. And in fact, you're not gonna go exponentially. You essentially uh, 
have to sweep out the others here, very slow process. And uh, in the, in the gas-like phase, you have a competition uh, with a decent number of cells where you can imagine that perhaps beneficial mutations will grow exponentially. This is uh, something we, we, we are going to measure uh, in the future. Um, let me jump a couple of slides. I wanna go come to the end uh, and um, conclude the second part, uh, you know, about this bounded growth. So I think the important um, messages here, which, which could be general, is that, you know, you have this phenomenon of jamming that occurs uh, spontaneously, even without any stickiness, um, if, you know, the chambers are large enough. And what this jamming does is it, it promotes long-term colonization of the bacteria. It makes them kind of immune to take over by uh, other microbes that you bring in, but also to mutants um, of themselves, which has implications for how evolution might work in these um, constrained regions. Um, well, maybe it is relevant for the fly gut. That's something I wanna test with um, Will Ludington. And well, this is what I said before, competition is, you know, is, is strong or relatively strong in this gas-like phase where all these individuals that are in this larger blue region are competing. Uh, and it's relatively weak in, in the jam phase, potentially with implications for uh, natural selection. But there are also interesting twists to the story. And now I'm showing you a movie where I start, you know, again, with a green and dark strain like before. And it turns out these two are different. One is sensitive to tetracycline, the dark one, and green is not sensitive. And so if we bring in tetracycline, we select for the green one. And so I want to now show, um, demonstrate how natural selection is essentially playing out. And that's happening in this movie. So we start before we come with the antibiotic, we are in the jammed phase, and these are pipes that are mixed initially. And you see what happens, the dark, um, the dark guys, they disappear at first slowly, but then actually the population switches into the gas-like phase. Then they seem to appear more quickly, competition is harder. Um, and then the green ones grow up again and turn into, into, jammed, uh, into the jammed phase again. So I think quite an interesting interplay here between these phases and how selection might work. From the point of view um, of physics, um, um, I think there's the two in interesting parts about, first of all, this colonization transition, growth needs to supersede outflow. Uh, and the second one is, um, you know, you have a discontinuous jamming transition where we get, uh, you know, beyond the critical point, we get like two phases, one very dense phase and one is a dilute phase. And what's interesting about it is that we get it without any active motion. Um, I'm saying that because there's a well-known phenomenon that um, many people have studied, which is called motility-induced phase transition, where you um, also can generate phase separation between a dense and a dilute phase. But for that, you need active, um, some kind of, no, uh, active motion. You need active motion. We don't have any active motion. We only have active growth. All right. Um, I think I should pause here um, because anyway, over the time is over. Um, maybe let me first thank um, um, the people that are involved and then I can go back to the conclusion slide. So first of all, Yuya is really fantastic. Uh, he um, is now back in the lab trying to finalize uh, um, the, the work on, these, uh, on the pan flute. And I think there's lots of interesting things that uh, we can do by playing around with different strains, different conditions. And um, in, involved in much of this experimental work is also a series of postdocs and uh, PhD students. And I also wanna thank in particular Jason uh, Paulos who worked with me on um, the spreading phenomena or to extend the, the, the story on long range spreading. Now, actually since March, we. Uh, are back trying to extend this. 
um, it, it got started with Daniel Fisher uh, in Stanford. All right, uh, thank you all, and I can take questions if there are any. <laughs>